Everybody, welcome to Digital Asset News, or Dan for short. My name is Rob, and first I'd like to apologize. Usually we do these videos uh, quite early in the day, it's just that there was a lot of things going on, a lot of things that are happening, so we just did this a uh, little bit pushback. And I'm gonna take uh, Bicky's advice here and just delay the, the intro, because I guess uh, the intro gets cut off for some reason, so I'll say it again. Welcome to Digital Asset News. My name is Rob, and today we're gonna talk about, I think, some pretty scary things, quite honestly. And we're going to break this up into the non-hopium, hopium section. So the first part I'm going to talk about is thanks for listening. And then uh, we'll talk about the good news. Then we're going to get into the bad news, or as I like to call it, the reality. And then we're going to get into the principles of Bitcoin decentralization and diversification. I think it's going to all just wrap it all up quite nicely. And then lastly, at the very end, we'll go over a little Q&A. And I'm going to talk about a giveaway tomorrow, which is going to be, I believe, a Nano and also a Stonebook. So let's just jump into it. And let me just say this. First, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the things that I'm putting out. It's quite important if I'm just not talking to myself, because it's important that you do the things that I talk about, or not do the things, but consider the things that I'm talking about as far as the rules. And one of those rules was nothing on exchanges zero zip zilch and try to take those off as fast as possible and because of you and i a lot of people actually saying the same thing now which is what i like that we're kind of unified in the same direction which is taking your crypto off exchanges this is the uh, bitcoin exchange reserve and you can see that uh, over the last uh well, a couple of years or so uh, we are far 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 below uh what we used to do which is leave a lot of our bitcoin on the exchanges now we're taking control back we're kind of figuring out that, hey, uh, we can do this. We can take our crypto off. We can put it on cold storage or even hot storage on a MetaMask wall or any kind of wallet that you want to do. And we can control it. We can be our own banks. And it bypasses the middleman and it makes things, everything a lot better. Now, it's a little bit more work, let's be honest, because we've gotten quite lazy with using the banks and institutions. But I think this is the best way. And this is the, the way that we have to do this moving forward. So Again, thank you, everybody, for listening. And hopefully uh, the people that uh, do have things on exchanges, hopefully they took it off so we don't hear the stories about people losing their life savings. So there is that. And then here's the good news. I was uh, feeling pretty good about uh, this story. Dow Jones rallies on the cool inflation data. I guess uh, there was some Walmart surges on earnings, which I don't have stock in Walmart, but just helps the traditional market. And then, of course, it carries over to our market. So Dow Jones industrial average uh, rose more than 400 points Tuesday. That's pretty, that's today. After a cooler than expected reading in the PPI, which is a key inflation gauge. And remember, producer price index is kind of like the precursor to the consumer price index, which will be coming out in December, which will be right before the Fed meeting, before they decide to hike the basis points to 50 or 75. So that's a good sign. I'm not saying that the Fed's going to pivot, but it's positive because now things are slowing down. Dow Jones stocks, Home Depot, and Walmart reported their quarterly earnings results had the market, and apparently it was very good. So that's fantastic. So all this good news, how does that translate? Well, it actually translates pretty much better than I thought it would. So NASDAQ itself over five days is up, and uh, we can see the S&P 500 also up pretty well. I mean, everything's up across the board. I mean, heck, even art, art uh, is selling again. Paul Allen's art collection sets record with $1.5 billion sale. We'll get that a little bit later, but I'm just saying that we've got the traditional markets doing well. And then, of course, art is selling. That's great. How are we doing? Eh, not too bad. Look, Bitcoin didn't go down to 13K like I thought it might. Just didn't happen. And uh, I'm glad to be wrong. I mean, that's fine. I was kind of hoping for some better deals, but hey, I, I can't get everything I want to. Bitcoin's up a little bit, Ethereum's up a little bit, and everybody's uh, quite happy. I think there's nothing really fantastic gains except for Uniswap, and rightfully so, because I think people are going to uh, migrate more towards DeFi, so that's good. And then on top of the all the things that are happening in the market, I just want to make sure everybody realizes the things that, that are happening. Remember, uh, the exchanges are not the market, just like the economy is not the stock market. So... Right now, the exchanges screwed us. Sam Bakeman did a pretty great job. Celsius, sorry, sorry, sure. Voyager, Celsius, those types of things, those types of places, right? But the products themselves carry on. It's like, well, that's not us. And I wanna just give credence to one, which is uh, World Mobile. 
Now, I'm quite biased, as you know, on my channel. So I have invested in World Mobile Token. I am a node operator. But I just find it interesting that uh, there's products out there that are actually doing something, building, and have real-world utility, which is pretty awesome. So if you don't know World Mobile Token, this is, this is one of those air nodes right there. You can see that right, right there. This, I think, is outside of uh, probably Zanz yeah, Zanzibar City. And you've seen these types of things here in the States or in the UK or in, in, in EU or Australia. It's just a, it's just a node which, which operates for telecommunications so it can bounce signals off, right? So then on top of that, they've also launched another one of their aerostats, which is a big blimp, essentially. And that allows for uh, internet and telecommunications. And oh, and also, uh, it's built on Cardano, world mobile token. Right now, they got 152 total air nodes. Total network consumption is 1.05 terabytes, and here's the unique users, 15,000, and it's in Africa. Before everybody says, oh, well, Africa, well, it's, what's, uh, you know, what's so great about that? Huge natural resources in Africa. I think it could be the next economic power over time. However, uh, don't get too excited about that. World Mobile Token is, a, is really just getting started, and they got a long way to go because 1.05 terawatts over the last 24 hours all right, that's uh, it's pretty good. We're talking about 30, roughly 30 terabytes. But uh, just so you know, how many gigabytes does the average person in America or North America uses in a month? 536 gigabytes. So there's a mass here. Let's see, about 1,000 gigabytes is one terabyte. So not that it is like the most fantastic thing of all time, but it's a step in the right direction. So I just want to tip my hat to the people that are doing things and making things operate. Great job, World Mobile Token. You are bringing telecommunications to people who do not have it, and you're doing a great job. Thank you for making crypto and digital assets work. So that's the good news. That's as good as the hoping you're going to get today. Because after this, it kind of goes downhill. So if you want to stop right now, that's cool. I understand. I would uh, maybe, I would not want to stick around for the next part. But here we go. So here's the bad news, and it's the reality. And you got to take it with a grain of salt, because... You know, sometimes I get things wrong, but uh, here we go. First things first, I don't want to take advice from a guy who is a fraudster. However, it was interesting in a Forbes interview, Bankman Freed warns that some crypto exchanges already are secretly insolvent. I don't think that is too much of a stretch of the imagination that that, that is actually going on. I think he's right in some regard. Not that they're all insolvent. But I think we're going to see some what is called contagion. And we can see that. And we talked about this, this uh, fantastic. I don't know who did this diagram, but it's fantastic. And we take a look at exactly just how deep this could actually go. So there's SBF. Here's Alameda Investments. And we know that there's a bunch of things going on out there, right? Hotel Media, Lido, Masari, Polygon, Refinance, Solana. And my, my voice could keep going up, but uh, I don't want to. So FTX acquisitions, of course, Blockfolio, Ledger X, which is the difference. If it's a different from Ledger, Ledger X is some kind of platform. I want to say DeFi or something, but it's not the cold storage device. Voyager, BitDeck, Circle, no, I play up, Scheme Mavis, BlockFi. And of course, some of these, these companies have already come out and said, we are not contagious. <laughs> contagious. We are not contaminated by... Uh, this SBF and FTX Ventures and Alameda. However, there's been people that have, that have come out, such as Skybridge Capital, such as WonderFi, such as BlockFi, and some others. So I'm not going to say that this contagion is wrapped up because it ain't. This is Travis Kling. And Travis is former equities portfolio manager, fell in the crypto rabbit hole, now running uh, Ikigai Fund. Uh, not investment advice. That's the truth. Uh, this was, uh, is this today? This is yesterday. Yeah, he says, uh, uh, unfortunately, folks, I have some pretty bad news to share. Last week, a guy was caught up in the FTX class. We had a large majority of the hedges funds total assets on FTX. By the time we went to withdraw Monday morning, we got very little out. We're now stuck alongside everyone else. And it's a very, I'm not going to read it because it's quite, kind of depressing. But uh, you get my drift. Uh, this will probably won't be the last one that we hear about. How deep could it go? I don't know. Uh, check out all the different Twitter feeds and, and the conspiracy theories and things that are going on. It could go super deep. But I'm not here to speculate. I'm just here to tell you the things that I know. And here's what I know. Fed 
Federal Reserve, Michael Barr, is concerned about blowback to the financial system from crypto. And tell me if I'm crazy, but it seems like this worked out really well for regulators and the government itself as FTX collapses. Because, hey, you know, these guys, they were, they were frauds and, and we could have protected you harder, but, you know, Congress didn't pass anything. Now, if we, if we push this thing through, I'm old enough to remember all the different wars that came about and the lies that were told. And I'm not going to sit here and say it is or say it isn't. I'm just saying it's happened before. It could happen again. So Michael Barr, Federal Reserve's top financial regulatory official, said he is concerned about risks from the non-bank sector, including crypto for which the U.S. Central Bank and other regulators have poor visibility. Barr said, and this is at a Senate banking committee, this was today, that includes obviously crypto activity, but more broadly risks in parts of the financial system where we don't have good visibility. We don't have good transparency. We don't have good data, meaning we want it, give it to us. Sure. He also had signaled stiffer oversight of the crypto arena is in the offing, offering, an issue that has taken on added urgency with the collapse last week of crypto F uh, FTX. He states, and I think this is positive, but take it with a grain of salt from who it's coming from. We do not want to stifle innovation, but when regulation is lax or behind the curve, it can facilitate risk taking, <laughs> of course, and a race to the bottom that puts consumers, businesses, and the economy in danger and discredits new products and services with consumers and investors. Nothing he said here is a lie. I have to admit, it's true. And uh, on some of these parts, sometimes when you let the inmates run the asylum, some bad things happen. I think we can all agree there. So in front of this committee, Senator Patrick Toomey, who is a huge proponent of crypto. Uh, Toomey's a pretty good guy. So he asks why they have not issued guidance to banks about forming relationships, such as custody service with crypto firms that could foster great oversight of the sector. And this is where it gets, this last part is where you really got to grind it down, and this isn't good. Toomey voiced concern that the Fed was signaling it may issue guidance to banks wishing to provide custody services for crypto assets to place those assets on the balance sheets. That sounds great, right? That's what we want, doesn't it? Well, not so fast. Toomey said, he asked Barr this, he goes, but wouldn't this impose a significant cost on banks if they are in fact obligated to put all of the crypto custody assets on the balance sheets. Why is that a problem? Banks, or Barr said, we've seen banks operate in a pretty cautious date. There are very few institutions that are currently seeking to engage in custody activity. Securities and Exchange Commission accounting interpretations for publicly traded banks that they would need to hold. This was the crux of it. Let me read this again because I went too fast. The SEC interpretations for publicly traded banks state that they would need to hold capital against the crypto assets held in custody in a way that they would not need it for traditional custody assets. What they're saying here is, is as such. If a bank comes in and says, we want to hold Bitcoin for you, we will provide that service, okay? They can't just hold the Bitcoin and keep your money. They're gonna say, well, you're also gonna have to, which doesn't make much sense if you think about it, they're also gonna have to have a reserve of funds for the value of that Bitcoin in, for whatever reason, if the person comes in and says, you know what, I don't want that Bitcoin anymore, I want the dollars. Well, it was worth this and now it's worth this. What they're trying to do is play like a, th a three card Monty. You go, no, no, no. If you have Bitcoin, you have to have the, the Bitcoin plus the value of the Bitcoin in reserves in cash or, or whatever kind of assets that you want to, want to say. And they'll probably give them guidance later on. If that's the case, how many banks should be like, sure, sign me up. Let me hold double. <laughs> no, it's not going to work like that. And that is a big problem. And this would lead me to my last part here. And I got to tell you, maybe this was all planned out. I'm not for sure. And this was the whole point of the video. Banking giants and New York Fed start a 12-week digital dollar pilot. CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. And they're going to start it now. Let that sink in. Global banking giants... That's, that's a stretch. Are starting a 12-week digital dollar pilot with the Fed Reserve Bank of New York. The participants announced on Tuesday. Well, I guess it is. Citibank, MasterCard, 
and Wells Fargo are among, are among the financial companies participating in the experiment alongside the New York Fed's Innovation Center. The product, which is called the Regulated Liability Network, will be conducted in a test environment that use simulated data. The pilot test will show how banks can use digital dollar tokens in a common database can help speed up payments. Remember, a common database, a common database. Well, that could be blockchain. It's not very decentralized, especially if it's a single point of failure. So all the things that we had talk, talk about, about CBDCs coming, and people are like, well, how far away are they? Well, here they are. They're right around the corner, and they're going to trial it right now here in America. And we're not talking about the digital yuan, which has already been rolled out over a year or so. Now we're going for CBDCs. And I have to ask myself, was this just the master plan all along? I'm not saying it is. So the question then becomes, well, Rob, how does that compare? Because CBDCs, wouldn't that be like crypto or digital asset? It's a digital asset. But is it decentralized? Because you can have cryptos and blockchain, just like China talks about blockchain. That's not the real deal. And we talked about this yesterday. We talked about, we took a look at the white paper, Satoshi Nakamoto. And we talked about how Bitcoin was a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. It's to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution, which is essentially what the CBDCs will be, right? And there's one thing that I did leave out yesterday because we did talk about payments, peer-to-peer -peer version of payments. But you have to remember, and people will say, well, is it really this? It is a store of value. It just depends on the time frame that you're looking at. And that is a big thing. I need you to remember a couple of things. First of all, yes, we know inflation is high, but right now, like a friend of the show, Ben, and then the cryptoverse says, cash is king if you're an investor. And yes, inflation does go up, but hey, it hasn't, uh, hasn't inflated away 60, 70%, has it? That's what uh, Bitcoin has dropped over the last oh, year or so. However, if your time horizon is long enough, this is what, what, this is what one Bitcoin can get you. In 1980, 20 bucks gets you a, a, a cart full of groceries. In 2000, about half a cart. In 2022, 20 bucks can't go far, especially here in Puerto Rico. It's just not happening. In 2011, one Bitcoin gets you, which was about 20 bucks back then, a cart full of groceries. 2021, it could have bought you a pretty damn nice truck. And 2030, who knows what, what it could be. Again, volatility and things along the way. But there's, a, there's one thing that I need you guys to really focus on, which is people are going to talk about CBDCs and the government. They're like, what's the difference? I mean, that's the same thing, right? We can just use that. But wait, wait for a second. There's this website. Dan teaches crypto. It's 100% free. I made it free so you don't have to pay a dime. I cover all the costs and everything else. Not a big deal. And the very first video that I have in module one, the basics, is this video right here. The easiest way to understand Bitcoin. This is about five minutes long. This is Peter Van Valkenburg. And, he, and he's testifying before a Senate committee. And that right there is, doc, he's, he's testifying right by Dr. Doom. No, 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 Robbie, no, Ruby, how do you say his name? And I want you just to listen to this again. I need you to really delve into what he's talking about as far as, and just think about how this will differ, how it differs from the CBDC. So just take a listen real quick, about five minutes or so. Always a good reminder. My name is Peter Van Valkenburg and I'm the director of research at Coin Center, an independent nonprofit focused on the public policy issues affecting cryptocurrency and public blockchain networks. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the world's first cryptocurrency and it works because of the world's first public blockchain network. What does Bitcoin do? It's simple. It lets you send and receive value to and from anyone in the world using nothing more than a computer and an internet connection. Now, why is it revolutionary? Because unlike every other tool for sending money over the internet, it works without the need to trust a middleman. The lack of any corporation in between means that Bitcoin is the world's first public digital payments infrastructure. And by public, I simply mean available to all and not owned by any single entity. Now, we have public infrastructure for information, for websites, for email. It's called the internet. But the only public payments infrastructure that we have is cash, 
as in paper money, and it only works in face-to-face -face transactions. Before Bitcoin, if you wanted to pay someone remotely over the phone or the internet, then you could not use public infrastructure. You would rely on a private bank to open their books and add a ledger entry that debits you and credits the person you're paying. And if you both don't use the same bank, well, then there'll be multiple banks and multiple ledger entries in between. With Bitcoin, the ledger is the public blockchain and anyone can add an entry to that ledger, transferring their Bitcoins to someone else. And anyone, regardless of their nationality, race, religion, gender, sex, or credit worthiness, can for absolutely no cost create a Bitcoin address in order to receive payments digitally. Bitcoin is the world's first globally accessible public money. Is it perfect? No. Neither was email when it was invented in 1972. Bitcoin's not the best money on every margin. Uh, it's not yet accepted everywhere. It's not used often to quote prices, and it's not always a stable store of value. But it is working, and the mere fact that it works without trusted intermediaries is amazing. It's a computer science breakthrough, and it will be as significant for freedom, prosperity, and human flourishing as the birth of the internet. And Bitcoin is just the beginning. If we can replace private payments infrastructure, then we can replace other private choke points to human interaction as well. Now, why should we want to build more public infrastructure? Why should we embrace blockchains over corporate intermediaries? Why should we tolerate their inefficiencies and work to make them better? Why should we want the pioneers of this technology here in the United States and not fleeing overseas? A simple reason, because the corporate intermediaries providing today's critical but privately owned infrastructure are becoming fewer, larger, and more powerful, and their failures are incre increasingly grave. So roughly half of all Americans, 143 million people, had their social security numbers exposed to hackers because of a breach at Equifax. The SWIFT network has relayed hundreds of millions of dollars in fraudulent transactions because of hacked member banks in Bangladesh, Vietnam, Ecuador, and Russia. The FBI suspects now that the largest of these hacks was perpetrated by North Korea. Corrupt, low-level employees at an Indian bank, Punjab National, were able to fraudulently certify swift messages stealing $1.8 billion. It's the largest electronic bank robbery in history. In fact, it's the largest bank robbery in history. In October 2016, an estimated 1.2 million internet-connected devices were hacked and turned into a botnet that for several hours made prominent websites unavailable across Europe and North America, including CNN and Fox News, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. Increasingly, physical machines are being connected to the internet to augment their capabilities. They're wired through servers that are owned and maintained by private and trusted intermediaries the so-called Internet of Things. Pacemakers from St. Jude's Hospital have been hacked. Baby monitors from TrendNet have been hacked. And Jeeps from Jeep have been hacked to the point where they can be remotely commandeered and driven off the road. Now, those vulnerabilities are inescapable in systems that have single points of failure. It doesn't matter if the point of failure is a corporation or if it's a government. There shouldn't be a single point of failure. Similar choke points existed before the internet. If you wanted to deliver a message, you'd have to go through one of three television broadcasters or a handful of newspapers. Private corporations are essential, but no critical infrastructure should rely on one or two. The internet removed single points of failure in communications infrastructure and ushered in a wave of competition among new media corporations building on top of its public rails. Blockchains can similarly disintermediate critical payments and IoT infrastructure. The technology is not yet ready to answer all of those questions today, but it is our best hope. And as with the internet in the 1990s, we need a light touch pro-innovation policy to ensure that these innovations flourish in America for the benefit and security of all Americans. Well, let's see if that comes to pass. But uh, that was the whole 
crux of uh, what we're trying to talk about here, which is a single point of failure. Look, if the government wants to do a digital dollar, let them do those things. Maybe it'll, it'll solve some kind of problems that people can use it. That's great. But again, if we're trying to take a look at what could potentially be a better outcome and a better, a better way to do things, no middleman. Send out any, any kind of transaction that you want to. Don't have to ask for any kind of permission. And then just use it on a global scale. And the last thing I always think about is this, is I'm not going to use the digital yuan. And I don't know, I don't know a lot of countries are, go, are going to want to use that. And then as we go through a digital dollar, some, some different countries will, but you can never have enough trust globally to actually use it. And that's why it's a good thing to have a trustless type of system. So anyhow, let me just think about that in the comments section. And then now that we've talked about all the, the good news, the bad news, I think we have to take, take a look at the reality. And the reality right now is that the market isn't that fantastic and who knows what's going to happen. So I'm not a financial advisor. I can't give you financial advice. However, I would like to make mention that it's important to diversify just a little bit. Here's my look at diversification, cash and and some stables, some DGEN plays, masterworks, fractionalized shares of our pieces, land, property, stocks, the Amazon business, staking, of course, I trust capital IRA. And it's important to really think about the things that are working out right now. So right now, I want to first of all, I want to thank uh, sponsor to the show, Masterworks. I appreciate it. I'm going to have on uh, Mr. Sucklitz. And uh, he, me and him did a, a quick video, which talked about, actually what we talked about right here, which is Paul Allen's, this 1.5 billion sale, which is going on right now uh, in a bear market. And when he talks about these things, I want you to listen. This is about four minutes or so. Talk, listen to what he talks about as far as finite, the things that are scarce, and how it also correlates to the crypto digital asset market, especially with art. Again, not a financial advisor, but this is just what I have done personally. So just take a listen. Uh, help us understand what's going on in the interesting world of the art market. Alan Sokolitsky, Chief Financial Officer, thanks for coming back on and talking to us. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah. So this is interesting because right now you're beating, you're beating the traditional markets. You're definitely crushing cryptocurrency and digital asset markets. And there was a, a big story just came out. Uh, Paul Allen's art collection sets a record. And I don't know how this is possible. It's, it's a one and a half billion dollar sale. And this is over two days. And you guys are setting, you're breaking records right now in a bear market. So not only that, I mean, you got a couple pieces. You sold the condo for 21 and a half percent appreciation, 33, 33% uh, uh, profit, 27.3% Brown and Olin. So Alan, just talk to us because it's hard for me to wrap my head around this. So what's going on in the art market? What, what are we missing here? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it's one of the things that we've been saying over and over for several years now is if you want true, true diversification, you should consider investing in art. And, and it's it's even goes farther than the diversification you might get in other traditional asset classes. Right. You might want to diversify your stocks with, let's say, bonds. That gives you some level of diversification, but probably not all the time. This year would be a prime example because stocks are down 20% and bonds are down 15%. So you're not getting a whole lot of diversification benefits there, but right. you get what I describe as true diversification out of investing in art. And you know, we do often get the question, which is, I, I don't really understand. I mean, how is it that the art market actually operates this way where right now, literally in the midst of stock weakness, bond weakness, crypto weakness, in the midst of all that, yeah. you have a one and a half billion dollar art collection that just got sold. How is that even possible? And the best answer that I've been able to come up with is that the art market has probably one of the most unique supply dynamics in it. And what I mean by that is when you think about multi-million dollar paintings, each mm -hmm. one of those paintings is the only one in existence. There, there are no multiple versions of the same painting. They're, they're all one of a kind. So when you're talking about price points in the art market that are multi-million dollars, that typically already gives you the impression that these must be paintings that have been appreciated for a long time by many art collectors around the world. There's sort of, there's a history, there's a provenance, there's a long held appreciation for them. Otherwise, 
you know, to be frank, how could they have gotten to multi-million dollars if that wasn't the case? And so when you get to those levels, you realize that you're basically owning an asset, each one that is truly one of a kind. That That's probably the most attractive supply story that you could ever have in any investment that you're going to make, where the one that you have is the only one in existence. And so going back to Paul Allen's, uh, you know, collection that's that sold. And by the way, that one and a half billion, that was just yesterday. This is, yeah. this is a two day auction. So that, so that was just yesterday. Um, the, basically, the, the collection, they had several lots of paintings, a lot, by the way, for um, any of your viewers who might not be familiar in the auction market, a lot just refers to a group of works that are all sort of sold together as a group or, or a, a package in a sense, but that's probably not the right word to use. But um, yeah. there were several lots that sold for more than $100 million, several lots that sold for more than $100 million. And again, this just goes back to the same thing that we've been repeating for several years now. The art market moves to the beat of its own drum. And this year has really allowed us to hammer that point home in real time. Yeah, I, I mean, we know, we know a lot about what you're talking about as far as the scarcity aspect aspect of it. What is finite? Uh, you know, with of course with Bitcoin, we have 21 million. It's it's hard code. It'll never go above that. Other cryptos, it, it that is not the case. But when we talk about scarcity and the finite of certain assets, that does make a lot of sense. So to talk about this and. When you guys first came, you know, we, we first started talking, I thought it was a pretty decent idea. I'm like, oh, it sounds like, you know, a pretty good way to, to, to di diversify. But now that I see what's going on with the S&P 500, NASDAQ, and of course the crypto market, we just lost $400 billion in the last 48 hours. So I can definitely see how this was. I mean, for me, I've got a couple. I got a basket and I have a Banksy and it's been a good thing because when, when something goes down, like this also a couple of my different uh, stocks that I have and options. Uh, I will also see that. Well, thank God I got something that's going up and that's masterworks. And that's kind of just goes around uh, what we're talking about. So Alan, I want to say again, thanks for stopping by. We appreciate just you just taking the time to, to come on here. I will just say this, this last piece. And that is that the reason why we lost those hundreds of billions of dollars, really what, what it comes down to is, is an oversight and the ability not to take a look about what's going on behind the scenes. And I have been talking about for, for clarity, for regulation. And thankfully, I mean, with you guys here at uh, Masterworks, don't everybody forget that every single piece that they have is registered with the SEC it, because they are securities. And you can find that information on their website. I have a link down in the description. And every single one they have, again, it is registered with the SEC because they are securities. If you're looking for more information, link in the description looks just like this. And we also did a deep dive, so check that out. Again, Alan, I can't thank you enough for stopping by. Thank you very much. All right, easy peasy down to the business. And that is it. So look, for tomorrow, today is Tuesday, I believe, Wednesday, we're going to start doing some giveaways because uh, I got to tell you, I want everybody to not make the same mistakes I did, which was lose my mnemonic phrases, uh, which I lost uh, Cardano, about 20,000 of those, just disappeared in some god-awful who-knows notebook that I had somewhere. So we're going to be giving away some shield folios this week and also couple of ledgers because uh let's be honest i think we should all take them off and if you're just waiting this would be the time to do it so giveaways this week we'll start tomorrow with a shield folio we'll finish up the week with an nano ledger x and go from there but that right now does it for the news so if you got to take off take off it's been 33 minutes i appreciate you stopping by uh if you like today's video or found some information useful give it a thumbs up i'll consider subscribing hopefully youtube uh, notifies you probably not but uh, if you want to stick around, that's great. I'll answer all your burning questions the best of my abilities right now. Let's do a little Q&A. So let's jump into the Q&A. Let's see. Let me get rid of this banner. My favorite part of the, favorite part of the show.